Hello and welcome once again to a very special bonus episode of The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today we're very pleased to welcome two special guests, Mark Sundaram and Avon McMaster. Mark is a medievalist and linguist who specializes in the history of the English language. Avon is a classicist who studies Latin poetry and Roman social history. And they're both hosts of the Endless Knot podcast. And they both work on the YouTube channel Alliterative, where they use etymology, language, literature, and history to explore the web of connections in the world around us. Thank you and welcome to uh, The Spatter Inn, Mark and Avon. Hello. Hello, and thanks for having us. We're really happy to be with you. Now, uh, on your podcast and on your YouTube channel, you do a lot of etymological investigations of the world in perhaps more of a modern scientific approach than Isidore did in the <laughs> etymologies, but, you know, he was using the tools he had at his time. And so I assume you're both deeply interested in etymologies, and I'm curious, how did how did you find out about that? How did it hook you? I mean, for me, I always enjoyed kind of flipping through the dictionary um, and you know, looking at the the standard etymological information in any household dictionary, you know, you, you get a taste of that. And then, you know, later on, uh, when I was in high school, I got to study Latin and Greek. And so once you start doing that, you realize, wow, okay, there's, you know, a lot of these words are kind of in common with English for one reason or another. Um, and I eventually bought uh, a, a, a an actual etymological dictionary, which was uh, John Ato's Dictionary of Word Origins. And I think I was an undergraduate at the time when I got that. And one of the things I really liked about it is at the end of each sort of discursive entry about where a word comes from, it lists a bunch of cognates. And so I found that really fun to sort of be surprised how, you know, two words that don't necessarily seem like they're related actually come from the same place. Do you remember one of those off the top of your head? Well, an interesting one is uh, the word equip and ship. Oh. They sound a little bit similar. And the interesting thing is they both come from a, a Germanic word, the word ship or skip, but one of them passes through Old French on the way, uh, equip. So equip was originally meant to fit out a ship. Huh. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I can see it. I, that makes sense. Yep. That one I did not know. Huh. And of course, French being French, they dropped one of the letters in yeah. the S because French <laughs> drops all letters. Yeah, yes. they'll do that. <laughs> Avon, what about you? How did you get uh, hooked onto this? Well, my family was always really into words. My mother is a poet. My father did early work on computer language training, like back in the 70s, about can computers learn languages? And so our household was one of the households that had a dictionary right beside the dining room table because every conversation was going to end with an argument about where a word came from or what its pronunciation was or something. And so we always had the Oxford Dictionary next to our table. And I I was always interested in words, and that just continued. And I also went and did Latin and Greek in high school. And the thing I think that cemented it for me was for my 16th birthday, which was a big deal in my family. It's, you know, it's exciting. I got a very fancy Laura Ashley dress, which will date me to a very specific time in place <laughs> for people. And I went out to a fancy dinner with my dad for, you know, a nice birthday. And I asked for one special birthday present, and my special birthday present was the Oxford Etymological Dictionary. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and my parents were, really? Are you sure? No, please. And I got it, and I was thrilled, and I still have it, and it was one of the best presents I ever got. So I was kind of doomed. <laughs> so even your parents who were word nerds, were also like, are you sure? Even they, is... <laughs> even they were a little bit, of, thought it was a little over the top. But yeah, and then and then I went on and did classics and studying languages and literature just kept me. I, I'm not the prime mover in this etymological project we do, but I am have always been interested in it and it continues to be something that I find fascinating. And it was, I also found when I taught Latin, that being able to point out connections between Latin and English and French to my students was a very, very important way to help them with vocabulary learning. So Yeah, no, absolutely. I found that when I was taking Latin in particular, uh, when I was 
in college. Learning Latin gave me a kind of ability to see into words that they became much more like 3D, that you could reach in and grab little kernels that weren't visible before, and just made all of romance-based languages that much richer. Yeah, exactly. Do you still have... I mean. I mean, I know the answer to this, but do you still have a fondness for particular dictionaries and 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 linguistic reference works like that? Uh, I'm I'm obsessed with them, so I have many many dictionaries in this house. Um, I kind of collect them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I and I I get I have a great sort of attachment to them. One of the things that I, I think people don't do enough is read the prefaces to their dictionaries. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, we often talk about, you know, how does this word get into the dictionary? And they talk about the dictionary as if it's this sort of platonic <laughs> ideal that is that has great authority over how words exist in the world or something. And they're not. I mean, they're written by people who have their own interests or biases or or motivations for putting together the dictionary that they're doing. And so they have personality. And for me, that's that's what I get really excited about, is how different dictionaries have different personalities. It's so interesting to hear you say that, because as you guys have been talking, I've been thinking about how the pleasure of learning about the history of words has changed over the last decades. You know, uh, like I too remember having the really intoxicating experience of stumbling on the Oxford English Dictionary and like, wow, there's the history of the word, you know, in each one of these entries and being blown away by this. But of course, as time's gone by, people are more and more encountering the history of words through online media. And so instead of having a sense of the history of the word as someone has narrated that history of the word, right, in whatever dictionary it is you're looking at, they're instead getting this kind of more often more generic, um, piecemeal, um, kind of fragmented history of the word. And so that's why it's really neat to hear you talk about what is the value of those books? What do we get out of those books, those stories? well-integrated stories of the word is very different from what people are getting online. I think it's interesting that at the same time as what you say is very true, but at the same time as I think for most people who don't live in this house, the value of a physical dictionary has waned and mm. you know, many fewer people are going to have a physical dictionary or 22 on their shelves. <laughs> but at the same time, I think there's been a real appetite in the last 15, 20, I mean, for longer than that, but especially the last while, for books that do what an etymological dictionary does in perhaps a more informal way and not as rigorous sometimes, uh, but that do it in a more narrative way with a kind of personality. Like, I think there is a new market for, or at least a new appetite for, so I'm thinking of, we've got several friends that won't surprise you to know who work in this kind of field. <laughs> um, so there's a, quite a number of them in the in the UK in particular, there's like Paul Anthony Jones or Hagrid Hawks on Twitter, who goes and finds old dictionaries and finds odd, weird words and has put out numbers and numbers of books. And there, there's a real personality to what he collects and how he defines things and what he can, brings together. Or Susie Dent, who does uh, stuff coming out of the dictionary, but again, does these collections of words and some of it's etymological, some of it's the joy of old words. But very, in a way, very personality focused, these books. They're not mm-hmm. reference books. They're they're probably, frankly, in most people's bathrooms, uh, I'm going to bet, <laughs> is where they're kept for that sort of dipping in and out reading. But lots of people really like them. And I think that it is going back in a way to that kind of mediated by an individual that uh, people don't think of dictionaries that way anymore because they're just online. They feel very impersonal. They don't see them as being... Uh, human in any way. I think that's true. I think it also makes it easier to approach books like Susie Dent's, for example, that which I have looked at, you know, which are more like guided tours of interesting parts of the dictionary or or multiple dictionaries, actually. And uh, you get that, and 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 it makes it easier to see what it might mean to approach the dictionary or similar reference works as literature, that there are these highlights, these nuggets to be found within it, that, you know, if you don't want to sit through the quote-unquote boring entries, you can at least find the highlights and that can sort of show you the way, um, which is doing an interesting work in terms of like how you interface with that that text and that information, which is, I think, a little bit different from the prefaces that you were describing, mm. where you get much more of a sense of like how this specific book came to be and what it's doing. We grew up with a copy of uh, Webster's Third New International Dictionary in the house. 
how fantastic. And <laughs> I, as a child, read the preface because I guess I was shocked to see that there was one there. And like, you know, an introduction to the dictionary to teach you how to read the dictionary, which is teaching you how to read. Like, there was a, a weird <laughs> layer of meta that I think I thought was confusing and I wanted to see what was going on. And I, I, I don't want to overstate how exciting that preface was for me as a child, but I think, I think it was pretty compelling and still had like an interesting story to tell about what their approach to language was. And it's a, it's still a really great preface to read if anyone hasn't read it out there. Uh, it's a delight. And they made some big choices for that dictionary. Oh, oh boy, did that spark a controversy. <laughs> that, that particular edition, you know, started this whole dictionary war in the 60s, uh, which eventually led to the American Heritage Dictionary coming out to sort of do damage control in in the minds of some uh that that the uh, editors of uh the merriam webster third edition had done being so permissive you know in, in terms of how they treated their words <laughs> yeah how dare they include the word ain't <laughs> <laughs> and the american heritage dictionary has not only a very interesting preface and <laughs> justification for the way it treats words but it has those discursive usage panels all the way through yeah which are these things like, here's this word ain't, let us tell you why you should or shouldn't use it. And that's a narrative. Like there's actually stories mm -hmm. in the dictionary. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, it invites us to think about what is a dictionary for, right? And that can be prescriptive or descriptive, but it can also be, how can I put it, about pleasures of language that aren't totally captured by either one of those prescriptive or descriptive approaches. So, I mean, I'm thinking back to Isidore again, you know, in other words, what are these compendious lists of words for? Um, and it seems like that's really a moving target over time, isn't it? Yeah. Well, although, I, you know, I would say that the motivation for, for doing that has probably been there as long as people have, you know, consciously thought about the words. I mean, yes, there's been a, a bunch of books like that published recently, but, uh, you know, one of the, one of my sort of favorite dictionaries is um, by a man named uh, Ernest Weekly, uh, and he, he published an etymological dictionary of modern English in 1921. He is, by the way, his wife was the, the woman that D.H. Lawrence eloped with. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> and, I guess she, well, and it, it was supposedly it, uh, an inspiration for Lady Chatterley's lover. So I guess it is this idea of the, you know, the brainy man and the wife who leaves for, for passion. Hmm. Um, but in addition to, to, you know, putting together that dictionary, he also wrote a book called The Romance of Words in 1912. Um, and it is exactly that. He's intending this for just the general audience, not for specialists. And he, you know, in his preface, he talks about how it's it's for the amusement of people to to entertain people who get sort of intellectual pleasure from just knowing about word history. People wanted this kind of thing. Uh, you know, this is not just a, a recent phenomenon. Yes, I certainly didn't mean to suggest that it was recent. I just meant that with the decline of dictionaries does not come a decline of interest in no. such things. Yeah. People have continued to in a different way. Um, I think that question of why, just to tie it back to Isidore again, um, I, I do think that that is an interesting, that tension between pleasure mm -hmm. in simple simple or complex pleasure in knowing words, which can be tied, I think, in ways that aren't always pretty to pleasure in knowing words better than others know words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is certainly one, and I certainly fell prey to that as a teenager, you know, that and <laughs> in my younger years. Of course, I'm completely beyond any such ignoble impulses now, but, <laughs> but you know, that is something that I think there's, there's an intrinsic pleasure. There's also a pleasure that comes with feeling the extrinsic motivation of you're a good student or you know words well or you're articulate or all of those things. I have an amusing anecdote. When I was in, I think it was fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade, I was sitting there at the lunch table with three of my little friends and we're having conversation. And one of them says, you know, I wonder where the names of the days of the week come from. I think <laughs> this was a rhetorical question. She was not expecting an answer. And you can imagine what followed, right? Um, and I just still remember to this day, the shocked look. 
I understood something about myself that day. Uh, and I think we've all had yeah. that kind of yeah. experience, probably. Mm -hmm. And it's that, I mean, that pleasure in knowing a thing, finding it interesting, and wanting to share it that underlies your videos, Mark, for instance. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you know, there's, there's a real impulse there. I know a cool thing. Shouldn't the whole world know this cool thing? But at the same time, the other part that, and certainly your discussion of Isidore brought this out, is the idea that etymology has some kind of real meaning, right? A link to a truth, a, a greater understanding of the world uh, a, as, a, as a code, a, you know, as a key to understand unlocking the universe, mm -hmm. or as a, an understanding of the true meaning of words, and therefore I mean, the, the etymology of etymology suggests that, right? Yeah, that's the tr what it, etymology, of course, mm -hmm. it comes from, Mark. From etymos, Greek word that means true. Yeah, so true word. Um, and so that idea, which Isidore takes in one direction, and I mean, one of the things that kept my interest in etymology is when I went into Latin poetry, uh, Latin poets really love etymological wordplay, and they use it in a way that is not necessarily about unpacking the, you know, exact construction of the universe, but is about pushing towards an idea that words that are etymologically connected are also somehow thematically or meaningfully connected and kind of putting that together. So they'll they'll cluster words that they think are etymologically connected in four or five or six lines or ten lines in a close way that doesn't have an actual logical significance, like they're not saying this word comes from that word, but the collection of them all means something about the thematic element of that line and uh, I could I could give that an example in detail but it it gets annoying and Latinate but both Ovid and Virgil for instance I mean all all of the Latin poets do it Lucretius loves it too but Virgil and, and Ovid are both really well known for that kind of etymological play we'd almost call it punning and for them, it clearly means something, and they like to play with the Greek words, too, because they know that. So they'll use a Latin word that sounds like a Greek word instead of the Latin word that actually means what the Greek word means, or something, you know, in, in these, these plays. And they clearly think it's reflecting something real about the world, but it's intention with the just sheer pleasure of being able to manipulate and understand and play with the words that way. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, so I'm curious if if you guys have thought about this a bit, because the line between etymology and pun, especially in literary <laughs> works like this in poetry, I've long played with the idea that the pun is one of the like fundamental building blocks of poetry. Mm. Because it's taking some, you know, material aspect of the language, the way a piece of language sounds, and connecting it to some other piece of language and drawing meaning there, or trying to create a bridge of meaning there where maybe one didn't exist before, or maybe it did. But either way, you're trying to find something other than sort of the meaning of the words that would create meaning. You know, poetry is can be sometimes creating meaning through other means, through unexpected ways. Uh, that may or may not have made any sense, but the basic <laughs> idea is that it seems to me that when I encounter etymology in these classical and, and later poets, that they're trying to do something like that. They're trying to find other ways of drawing, of making connections and, and drawing lines between the world. But yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, a pun is basically doing the same thing as a simile or a metaphor. It's, you know, you're you're making a comparison between two things, and the the way that those two things correspond or uh, or rub up against each other or maybe contrast or whatever, you know, gives a lot of extra meaning, and you get all that for the price of using two words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's the 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 slippage between mm -hmm. the point of contact is that they sound the same mm -hmm. essentially, and then the slippage between the meaning or the slip or their how they're spelled or how they're used or whatever is where the meaning comes. The extra meaning comes. Isn't etymology kind of different in some ways, in the sense that it's kind of pushing us backward in time? That is, it has a different kind of relationship to how word and meaning unfolds over time. Like the pun is generative, and it's sort of in the present, extending toward the future in a way that etymology seems to me to be unpacking and sort of rewinding the tape, so to speak. Doesn't that depend, though, what your conception of etymology is? Yeah, that is, for sure. A modern etymologist thinks about the history of words. But I'm not sure when Ovid is using mora and maurice, which are delay and mulberry tree, and amor, 
um, all together in a whole bunch of puns. I don't know that he's thinking one derives from another in a historical linear, pro- but that they are all in one moment related to one another. And so they all, so I, I, I see what you mean, but I think maybe there's a difference depending on how you think about words. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. And also, I, I totally agree with you that there's that generative reduplicative quality. If you're looking at Ovid or Virgil, and you see something kind of similar in some of the 17th century English poets, like you see it in Marvell a lot, right? But I guess I was thinking back to Isidore, right? And thinking about the ways in which the etymology is about pointing backward toward this kind of originary moment before things fell apart or disintegrated or started <laughs> mm-hmm. to fragment, right? And I just find that so interesting, the temporalities of etymology, that can be sort of pointing this arrow back toward this um, vanishing point of origin, which you can't get to, right? But you can see it must be over there somewhere. And then this reduplicative quality that we're just talking about now, whether it's punning or whatever kind of term we use for it, that's generative and I think extending towards some sort of horizon, right? Some sort of future horizon. And I think it's really neat. I, don't, I love thinking about language in that kind of temporal timeline kind of way. I think that brings to my mind something that I was sort of gesturing towards before, that the joys of finding language pleasurable and etymology pleasurable, and then the other reason for doing or another reason is that finding truth. I think that in the present moment, there's a lot of people who are in some ways very Isidorian about etymology, who see etymology as meaning truth. We find this particularly in uh, comments on our YouTube videos, because as we all know, comments on YouTube videos are beds of roses and have nothing bad in them (laughs) at all. But in our videos, the two most common kind of pushback we get, one is, but this word comes from this word, therefore it means that and can never change, right? So that etymology is about finding, and it's always finding some arbitrary fixed point at which the, the origin comes at this moment, it's the etymological fallacy that because a word comes yeah. from something, it only can ever mean that. And so that's one way of, and it's it's like searching for a bedrock in this ever-changing world. But no, there's like a, there is a moment at which this word meant something and it can never change. And if you know the etymology, then you know the real truth of this word and it will never change its meaning. And then the other piece that we get, uh, and Mark can talk more about this, either of these if he wants to, because I know you have lots to say about them, is the if we trace language back far enough, we'll figure out what the first language is, and it's definitely Swedish, or Korean, or Romanian, or Turkish. Or Hebrew, as Isidore would say. Well, yes, the, we don't get a lot of Hebrew nationalist commentators, which is interesting, I think, because they already have the literature that goes mm. back so far, so they don't feel the same need. Um, or Tamil, or, you know, Sanskrit. But Sanskrit, but not Proto-Indo-European, because Proto-Indo-European is a Western lie, or whatever. In other words, there's a strong nationalist view that mm-hmm. if you use do etymology right, you will find out which language is the first and therefore the best. Oh, that sounds very. Fr- I mean, that's very frustrating, and I imagine it's yeah. very frustrating for you guys to deal with it. Have you ever like addressed that head on in one of your videos, or? or- yeah, uh, in our our video on the word nation, mm-hmm. um, we we. Uh, it, it, it was specifically, you know, uh, trying to push back against ethno-nationalism and the misuse of ideas of etymology and linguistics to to further ethno-nationalist um, thinking. Um, and yeah, in that case, I mean, there's one has to be, you know, have a certain amount of sensitivity because, you know, for instance, you brought up this uh, idea about how um, Sanskrit is the true earlier language mm-hmm. uh and and the the concept of um indo-european proto-indo-european is this western fabrication on the one hand it's it, i mean it is coming from uh, a place of uh you know a country that that suffered through colonialism and so you can kind of understand you know this uh, you know, india had a long history of you know very learned scholarship about text and words and so forth and suddenly these europeans are arriving and rewriting all of this and saying that everything in india came from outside of india actually except and, initially they yeah. didn't the early the earliest um you know indo-europeanists if you will 
they always at, at first used the Sanskrit form as the proto form because it was believed to be the earliest mm-hmm. recorded form that we have. And so probably it makes sense that uh, Proto Indo European most resembled Sanskrit. Until they found Hittite and a few other things. Yes. And, yeah. But so, yes, one understands why uh, there is a suspicion and a pushback against people coming in and telling them their mm-hmm. language. And, however, unfortunately, this has been used. Yeah, it plays out in, badly. In yeah. some fairly dark ways by Hindu nationalist uh, mm-hmm. forces in India. So, so yeah, in part, I, I felt I had to kind of push back against that a little bit. But at the same time, you know, treat treat the, the topic with a certain amount of um, tact and, mm-hmm. you know, trying to see, you know, kind of all sides of the argument. But yes, we certainly do get lots of people. And it, it's... It is frustrating, but it it can also be very funny. I mean, the, the the argument that Korean must be the original language because Korean is an isolate that has no known links to any other language in the world, therefore it must be the first one, and all languages must come from it, is a leap of logic that is, frankly, just entertaining. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and common. We get a lot of that one. <laughs> but it really does conduce toward an idea of talking about language in terms of its purity. I mean, you were talking earlier yes. about this kind of dogmatic attitude toward etymology you, you get in listeners sometimes. And that sort of ethno-nationalist context, we see this idea of linguistic purity play out not just in terms of origins, but also in terms of kind of cleaning up the language, right? Taking out things that are seen as invasive, right? Almost like, I don't know, invasive plants in a garden or something like that. Um, And that plays out in a certain way in South Asia. It plays out in other ways in the U.S., right? It plays out in all these different national environments. Um, And that must have been really challenging to take that on and present it for an audience in a way that would open the doors to some of those hard conversations, but not not overly inflame your audience either. That has to have been a really challenging thing to hit that sweet spot. Yeah, uh, and my intentions when I started writing that script, you know, did change over the course of doing it. I, you know, I went in planning to be much more sort of forceful and direct about this because I was just sort of irritated by getting all these comments. Um, but then as I read more about it and understood it in the, its historical context, I gained a lot more sympathy for those kinds of ideas, you know, especially when it is a question of, you know, Europe versus a formerly colonized country. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and I, I don't want to, I dwell too much on people who are getting it wrong and how funny <laughs> slash silly they are. So I'm curious if you have any stories about other types of very, you know, more positive interactions with people, like what is drawing people to etymology and, and how do you find sort of the grand, greater public, especially those who aren't academically trained in it necessarily, like what are they coming to you for? What are they coming to this study for and, and, and what are they contributing to it? I think a lot of the motivation comes from the fact that language is so personal and internal. You know, it's it, it exists in your head. You can close your eyes and plug your ears and, and not engage with the outside world at all, and yet you still have language going on. Um, so I think one of the things that attracts people to that is it's discussing something that they feel they have a part in that they have a share in. Um, and so they're always interested in, uh, you know, hearing things about language in a lot of different ways, um, including etymology. And I think one of the, the particular things that makes talking about etymology to a broader public so successful is it's, it's easier to get across some of the fundamental principles. Like if I were to try and discuss, syntax, the history of syntax with someone. I mean, it could be very interesting, but it's more difficult. Whereas saying, well, this English word can be traced back to this Latin word, that's that's a pretty easy concept to, to pick up. And then I can you know, further complicate that by saying, well, notice how, uh, you know, these two sounds are slightly different. Well, I can say, well, there's this, the reason for that, a certain sound change happened, and I can further, you know, add nuance to it. Um, but these are sort of concepts that I think are, are easily, easily enough graspable, and then you feel like you've suddenly discovered something really profound. And I do think that we play a little with, and I don't want to discount completely, the we're learning something about the world when we learn about etymology aspect of it, which I think is another thing that people are attracted to. And certainly you use and play with Mm -hmm. when you, when you do the videos, 
um, which is that while we may not feel that we are unpacking God's plan for the universe by understanding the true origins of words, it is nonetheless true that when you see the, the story of a word, where you see how a word has developed and often what its meanings were and maybe what languages it went through so that a Germanic word goes into French and then comes back into English, well, that is connected to actual historical mm-hmm. events. There's a reason a German word, a Germanic word, an English word, or a Viking word goes into French and then comes into English, and that has to do with actual historical events. Or when you see that a word like nice used to mean foolish and ended up meaning nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, there's almost no there's almost no synonym for nice, is there? It's, it's such a but when you see and you can and if you trace the development of that, that actually tells you something about people's attitudes towards uh certain kinds of knowledge and certain kinds of character traits over time and how that develops. Or if you see how a word goes from having a a one gendered association to a different gendered association, or has always had the same that feisty used to mean... Dog farts um, used to mean farted, but but then comes to mean, but has always been associated with diminutive things and with unpleasant things, but now is only ever used of women. You know, that tells you something about culture. So while we do kind of push back on the etymology as truth, on the one hand, on the other hand, I think that people really do enjoy finding that like thing they didn't know about where a word comes from a word they use, and I agree with Mark that it's like, but I use that word. I know that word. <laughs> that's my word too, right? That that's a, a, an excitement you have when somebody tells you something about something you, you do, that that also goes along with, oh, but now I know more about where that word comes from. I understand more about the history of my language and of my culture and of other people. Or often we get a lot of people who like our videos who are not English as a first language speaker. And one can totally understand that too, because that's a whole vista of the history of English that has opened up and the history of English speaking cultures that is opened up to someone just by, by learning a little bit about a particular word's history. And it's it's the fact that words do change over time mm-hmm. that's the the really that's what's you know, interesting educational about it. thing about it, right? Uh, the, uh, there's um, another one of my favorite etymological dictionaries by Ernest Klein, uh, a comprehensive etymological dictionary of the English language. Um, the subtitle of that uh, book is Dealing with the Origin of Words and Their Sense Developments, Thus Illustrating the History of Civilization and Culture. Ooh. Like that's that's big. That's <laughs> a really profound claim to make. <laughs> when is that from, Mark? I I can make a guess by the uh, type of title it has, but when is it from? Uh, not that long ago, 1971. Oh my goodness! Wow, <laughs> that was such a 17th century title. <laughs> I could not have called that. <laughs> he he had a bit of a, a sort of sad life in that he uh, he was uh, Jewish um, and living. I believe in Germany, um, and he lost much of his family uh, and eventually moved to Canada uh, to kind of put that previous life behind him. And so he he definitely had a kind of altruistic reason, motivation for writing an etymological dictionary. He, he, he says in his preface that he hopes this will bring peace and an understanding between people. Hmm. Interesting. I has somebody written a book, uh, or are you thinking of writing a book about like the lives of the etymologists? I mean, that would be very interesting. I I know I know of one one scholar who is sort of working on a kind of survey of uh, etymological dictionaries. It's more scholarly in nature and not as much storytelling. But that's Anatoly Lieberman, uh, who is an excellent etymologist and a brilliant writer. Uh, in addition to, uh, he's got like one of the finest books about etymology that I know of called uh, Word Origins and How We Know Them. Um, and he also writes a blog that if you're interested in etymology, his his blog, The the Oxford Etymologist, is an absolute must read because he's such a good writer. He, te- you know, he weaves these really nice stories. So, I, I mean, I would kind of like to read a book that he wrote about the, <laughs> the, the lives of etymologists. But, you know, if he's not going to do it, then yeah, maybe I could do that. <laughs> oh, maybe. I'm curious now, uh, if, if you were making a distinction between books about etymology and dictionaries of etymology, or just dictionaries that are useful 
as reference, as places to understand the history or the, the etymologies of words, versus ones that have a kind of literary excitement that give you that kind of readerly pleasure that maybe is not completely disconnected with, but somewhat distinct from the pleasure of learning and scholarship. Yeah, I mean, there are obviously dictionaries that are more straightforward and very compact and, and compressed in the way that they deliver the information. But so many of them, you know, and, and it's it's largely because it, particularly for, for words that don't have as straightforward a history, you have to unpack it to some extent. Um, and so etymological dictionaries, I find for that reason, are often a little bit more literary and um, kind of entertaining to read because they have to sort of discuss things a little bit more. Yeah, and they have to argue. They have to mm -hmm. essentially what you get, even in even the OED has very brief, but arguments mm -hmm. about that, you know, this is the argument for this etymology and this is the argument yeah. for this other etymology because in the end we don't know. And so they actually, you know, they give you, uh, which they don't tend to do for spellings. <laughs> yeah, or definitions. Well, I although... mean, they they give alternate spellings, but they don't usually yeah. argue for the spellings, or they don't give their reasoning, or they'll give multiple definitions, but they won't. They may expl give explanations they as might... to why. Yeah, something is spelled some way. Yeah, there are also Mark. I think dictionaries that you have. I mean, I don't know if this is what you were going for, Chris, but there are etymological dictionaries which you would never use as a reference source. For instance, Isidore, I don't think, it <laughs> makes it into your work cited very often. You might bring up what Isidore said about an origin of a word, but you wouldn't use him as an authority. No. Yeah. That's and I true. think that's true of a, you know, there's a certain period of dictionaries, let's say, where their etymological musings are not founded in the science as you approach it now. Mm-hmm. Though, uh, you know, I will say, and this is a point that Anatoly Lieberman makes, is that um, it, it's a mistake to discount an older etymology just because someone came up with it a long time ago. And that's one of the reasons why he is, you know, kind of trying to, you know, track all of these older dictionaries is because sometimes a suggestion for an etymology for a difficult word has been long been discounted and, you know, doesn't get repeated by newer resources. And he thinks, you know what, they may have had a point here. Mm -hmm. This may have been closer to the truth. Huh. So it's, it, I, I do, I do check older dictionaries, certainly, you know, 19th century mm -hmm. uh, dictionaries, I will check frequently because they often have interesting things in them still. That's a really interesting thing. The, the, I mean, it makes it sound like there is more of a creative act to a lot of etymology, even modern etymology, than might go into other aspects. Although, wow, I was about to say other things like definition, but actually, I've read enough about people who write definitions for dictionaries to know that that is a very hard skill, it's, even if you're trying to make it sort of to house style, to be as neutral and plain as possible, to not have the personality of of Johnson or, you know, some of the early fun dictionaries where everything was fun and witty and all that. Even if you're trying to be super boring, and, but you're trying to like get the essence to be as accurate and distinct and clear as possible, it's an incredibly difficult art. But it's not an art that is showy or that it's, 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 it's an art of not being noticed in a sense. Anyway, it just sounds like the, the kinds of creativity that you have to uh, or are encouraged to to do to devise etymologies for some of the trickier cases is a lot more creative than uh, we might expect. Yeah, I mean, and again, in the end, dictionaries are written by people. You know, they they're not. It's not like doing a math equation or something, right? And much as people treat them as that, they were not handed down by God. No. They did not come <laughs> down from a, from above. I think there's actually a real line to be drawn between. The work that an etymologist does, um, sort of using scientific method and reasoning and linguistics, and then at a certain point with certain kinds of words having to then make an argument or go with a gut or have a brilliant idea, uh, it seems to be very similar to how editing classical and medieval texts work. Mm. You know, there are definite <laughs> principles. There are real this is not it's not just making it up. There are real principles, and there's been a development from just vibes based editing of the sort of 16th 17th century up to really quite rigorous 
approaches to how how the principles are applied for using manuscripts and and figuring out best readings. And I I think this is it's true for medieval, but I think of it especially in terms of classical texts because classicists tend to try to get one text, whereas I know medievalists tend to be much happier with or much more willing to have five different versions from five different manuscripts or whatever. Well, it comes down to that prescriptive versus descriptive distinction, right? It's the same kind of thing, but on the level of text editing. Yeah. And so that idea of like using the rules, but at a certain point, the rules run out and you have to look at the the Latin phrase and say, well, I don't know. I don't think Virgil would have written it that way. I think it's got to be this. And I think that that there's an element of that that comes out with the etymology too. You come back a certain distance and you can go about a certain ways. And then there comes to, "Ah, I just, I, I think this is more likely than that. Or wait, what if it's this other thing? You know, and I think there's a kind of balance between those two aspects that is, uh, kind of this, you know, and they're both about words and about understanding words on a kind of deeper architectural level than people normally face them. Well, we are running out of time, but I thought I would give you guys a chance to plug one more favorite book that listeners might want to check out if they're interested in this sort of thing. What's a really good dictionary or book about etymology that's uh, a delight for a literary reader to look at? Well, one that is is very cheap, very easy to get, is Calvert Watkins' Dictionary of Indo-European Roots. It's kind of a reverse etymology dictionary because it lists all the Proto-Indo-European roots. It has an index at the end that you can use to, to look up the English word, and then it'll tell you what root it comes from. But it's it's very approachable and a fun read. So when I'm asked, you know, well, what book can I get? That's that's one of my first recommendations because it's not a big investment in that. So, and when you look up those roots, it then tells you what the root is, and then it, it lists you. a whole bunch of words that come from that root. Yeah, in English, um, and sometimes uh, gestures towards other languages. And one of the things that does is it shows you all these wildly, seemingly unrelated words that all come from the same root, mm-hmm. and just tracing that through is sort of a reverse history or a history from the beginning up yeah. rather than from now back. Oh, that sounds amazing. That, somehow that one is not in my collection of, of dictionaries and whatnot. Um, I will need to track it down. Uh, Avon, do you have a book you want to recommend? Well, I will go back to the books by our friend just because I really like them. Um, the books, the Haggard Hawks is one of the original books. It's not really etymology exactly, but it's about the pleasures of language. And he also has a book, fairly recent book called Why Is This a Question? And it's like an intro to linguistics, but from a just, it has a series of questions, including how are questions made? Why is this a question? But uh, about how language works, and it's witty, and it's fun, and it's easy, and I like it very much. And I would like to recommend that. That's Paul Anthony Jones, aka Haggard Hawks. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And everybody, go check out The Endless Knot and the Alliterative YouTube channel. Uh, We will have links for that in the show notes. And in fact, if you'd like to get in touch with us listeners, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 16. B and the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, see you again at the Spouter Inn.